So the first milestone that you did um, was the introduction to your paper and the history of your company. So the guide, we have the guide broken up to match the milestones, but we also have the guide as one whole document. So that's, that's what I have up here right now. So you've already done um, this, these first couple pages of your paper for milestone one. Your, um, the purpose of your paper, which all research academic papers, they always start with that sort of, what, why am I writing this? Why should you read it? And then the history of your company. Um, and then for this milestone, we're going to get into the next two sections of your paper. Um, so you can either look at the guide, the whole guide, like I'm showing you here for the entire paper, or you could just look at the, um, the guide, the template that's just for this milestone. They're the exact same. We just broke them down into pieces for you. So the first section that you're going to cover in milestone two for Eco 201 is the supply and demand condition section. This has two critical elements. Um, and the first critical element is asking you to evaluate the trends in demand over time. So the trends in demand over time basically speaks to how is demand for the goods or services that your company sells, how, how are those moving over time? Now when we say over time, usually in, throughout this guide we give a range of about five years, but you might want to expand that. Definitely don't make it less than five years when you want to look at these trends for anything, whether it's cost trends or demand trends like we're talking about here. Um, five years is sort of a bare minimum to really see, um, to see a trend. So when you're looking at those trends, it's really going to depend on your, the good or service that your company sells. But you'll want to see, you know, how are those, how are people's preferences changing? How are people's buying habits changing for this good or service as a whole? Not just for what your company sells. So for example, if you are doing a company like General Motors, General Motors sells cars and trucks. Um, so you would be looking at the demand for cars and trucks in general, not just for General Motors, cars and trucks. So you want to expand that. Um, so you'll see in the example paper, the actual student sample paper that we shared on um, in your resource, in your extra final project resource area in our course, um, there's an example paper on Hershey. So that student, when she evaluated the trends and demand over time, looked at all chocolate candy type of things, not just Hershey bars. So it's important that you, that you take that big picture view. And it's also important here that you look at the determinants of demand, um, of market demand. So of all of, like all cars and trucks, again, not just one specific brand. Um, the next part, you'll boil it down to your specific brand. But we've got here a link to our textbook reviewing what the determinants of market demand are and how they impact the market. Um, and then we've broken it down here for you in the guide, just as a very quick reminder, this is all from our textbook, the, the specific things that impact demand overall. So income, price of related goods, tastes, preferences, population and demographic, and expected future prices. So any of these things could impact um, the trends in demand over time for your good or service. Some of them might play a bigger role than others. So you're just going to find out what the story is for your good or service and tell that story with some research and some specific examples. So that part is generally pretty straightforward for students. Um, the next part is asking uh, for an analysis of information and data related to the demand and supply for your firm's products to support your recommendation for the firm's actions. So this is where you're going to kind of focus in a little bit more specifically on your company. Um, so the first place to start, because we are looking for specific information and data related to your company, is to start with that sales and revenue information. So I know in our last meeting, in our last webinar, I talked about um, the importance of going through the annual reports. Um, sometimes they're also called the 10K. Um, it's a very, very big document for companies. They put this out every year, sometimes, you know, over 100 pages. I know it's a very big thing to, to sift through, um, but it does have a lot of really valuable information that you're going to need, and one of those things is sales and revenue data. So this is where you start to show um, the demand for your firm's products. Um, you know, firms hope that they're increasing their sales uh, or increasing the number of things they sell or increasing their revenue at the very least. 
Um, and of course, with the goal to make more profit. Now, revenue, sales and revenue are not profit, but they're part of what determines how much profit a company makes. But this sales and revenue figure kind of gives you a sense of, of that demand for your company's brand. So with the case of General Motors, if they're increasing sales, they're increasing revenue, um, more people are buying their cars and trucks, or they're able to sell the same number of cars and trucks at a higher price. Um, so you'll be able to tell a story with, with that information once you have it. Um, it's really important to present that graphically um, per our rubric. So that's something that's it's very straightforward to do. Make sure you get that at least five years of data. Um, it can be the sales numbers. It can be revenue. Um, some students, depending on um, the company they chose, like with Netflix, uh, a lot of students do subscribership numbers instead of actual revenue numbers, or they do both. Um, but you really just want to show the trend and how much your company is selling in general. So we're going to scroll down a little bit to some other hints for here. So again, like I mentioned, include a graph, a graph table, or chart for the sales of your company, more than five years of data. Um, and then after you've done that, you can sort of examine some of the determinants of supply that can sort of inform how they're increasing their production or in what ways they're changing the offerings they give to their customers. Um, and here you can see some of the determinants of supply, input costs, technology, technology improvements, price of substitutes, number of firms in the market, and expected future prices. Um, now this is one lens to look at this through. Each company is going to have a little bit different of a story in how they're selling their product, if their company is expanding, if they're offering new services or new products. Um, but these are the sorts of things you, you can discuss. Um, when talking about how they're supplying their, their goods and their services. Um, looks like there's some action in the chat, and Ellen and Kate are on top of it, so that looks great. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, someone had asked about the abstract. Um, there, you, you probably did see an abstract at the top here. Um, that was more of a placeholder at this point for the milestone. Um, it definitely is required um, for the final to, to be flushed out. So we will um, review that for the, our final project webinar in week seven. All right, so generally students have a pretty, um, a pretty easy time with supply and demand section, those two critical elements. Um, usually it's pretty straightforward. Students understand how to talk about the trends in demand in the market overall um, and the data to look at how the company is actually doing in terms of sales is pretty easy to come by. And then you can start to tell a little bit of a story, all with information that you can find right in that annual report. You don't really have to go outside of that too much for this section, in the, um, for the most part, for that last critical element. Um, price less to save demand is the next section. And this section is pretty challenging for students. So I, I definitely want to take our time with this one um, and make sure that students feel comfortable addressing the three critical elements here. So price elasticity of demand, the first critical element that you're going to do in this section is to analyze information and data to justify how the price elasticity of demand for your product is determined. Um, so really what we're looking for here is for you to say, not a number exactly. It's going to be very difficult for you, like in our textbook, to calculate an exact price elasticity of demand. You're not going to be able to come out and say, price less to save demand for my company's product as 1.5. That's, that's unrealistic. So our expectation is that you will be able to say, price less to save demand for my company's good or service is either elastic, inelastic, or it could be unit elastic. But usually, you're going to come to a determination of elastic or inelastic. Um, and you have to, based on the rubric and based on the, um, the guidelines here, use information and data to justify that. So I think that the two best ways that you have to, to kind of make sure that you're capturing this, um, this element, is to look at research that's already been done on your product. Now, it doesn't have to be for your company in particular, but there is lots of economic research done by you know, accomplished economists 
um, on price elasticity of demand for certain products in general. And a lot of the products that are on our list would be included there. So economists have studied the price elasticity of demand for automobiles, for airline travel, for, um, for food products, um, for clothing, all sorts of stuff that falls into those categories have been studied. So that's one great place to start because that's some, some hard data that you can, you can use in your paper. Um, we don't expect you to be able to do that level of analysis since this is an introductory class, but you can certainly borrow um, that from a trained economist. So that's the first step. And then the second step, um, in addition to that, or if you're having trouble finding that, would be to look at actual pricing information for your company's product and for other similar products. Um, generally, if companies compete on price, that is an indication of elastic demand. Um, if companies don't feel the need to compete on price, or if they seem to raise prices without much loss in customers um, and other industry, I mean, other competitors in the industry do the same, then that would indicate an elastic demand. So those sort of historical pricing strategies um, can indicate an elastic or elastic. So that gives you some some very clear data and information to back up your determination. Um, and that would satisfy this first element. Um, either one of those things, or both would be great, <laughs> if, you can, if you can do both, would support your determination of price elasticity of demand is elastic or price elasticity of demand is inelastic. So it's really important that you make a clear determination and that you support it with some kind of um, data or information, like the examples I gave. So the next element, I think, is the one that's generally easiest for students to handle. Um, and that's explain the factors that affect consumer responsiveness to price changes. So consumer responsiveness to price changes is just sort of another way to say price elasticity of demand. Um, those are the same thing. So in this, this second element is really just asking you to apply the determinants of price elasticity of demand to your company's good or service. Um, so again, we've got a link here to our textbook. This is a video that goes through this concept in general. And then we've also, um, just to make things very straightforward for all of you, the determinants are listed here. So to get a, a hot a exemplary score on your final draft of this product, you should address each of these, um, of these elements, of these determinants of price elasticity of demand. Now, some of them will be more important for your company than others, or for your, the good or service that your company makes than others. But they all apply in some way. And some of them might affect your company in different ways. Um, so one might indicate more elastic demand, and one might indicate for your good or service more inelastic demand. So it's not that they all have to line up with the determination you made up top. But the ones that are the most important for your company should align with the determination you made in the first element. So I see a lot of questions in the chat, so I'm going to pause and make sure we're able to address those. Um, so John asks, would we be able to get most of this information from the annual reports over the past X number of years to know the demand and how pricing has affected it? Um, so John, yeah, you should be able to, definitely for, um, for sales, absolutely. Sales is always going to be in the annual report as a you know, graph or some sort of table or chart, absolutely. And then they have parts of the annual report, usually in a, right around the same area where they show the actual data and the graphs of their sales and revenue that talk about the market in general. Um, so that's the area you want to concentrate on, especially for this milestone, um, where they discuss that. They're going to discuss, you know, the market overall. They might discuss different geographic markets if they're expanding into new areas or new countries. Uh, and they'll probably discuss competitors as well. Um, so that shouldn't be difficult to find, I would say, all right from the annual reports. Now, some of this stuff in price elasticity of demand um, you may have to go outside of, especially if you're looking for research done on your um, product in general, like 
price elasticity of demand for cars. That's going to be academic research that you'll have to find separately from your company's annual report. But the annual report will probably talk about things like, were they able to, if they had to do a price increase, um, did they do that to pass off higher costs to their customers? Or did they have higher costs and not raise their price because they know that they can't pass that cost off to their customers um, because customers will buy so much less? So you can find those sorts of um, pricing strategies mentioned sometimes in annual reports. It really depends on the company and if they had to do a significant price change. Um, but those are the sorts of things to look for that you might be able to find in the annual report. Otherwise, you know, pricing information, that might be something you can just find on a company's website or, you know, if it's a consumer good, even just from a store, you know, if it's something like, uh, if you're doing Coca-Cola, you know, those are, those prices are pretty easy to find. So, like I said, this, this second um, element for price elasticity of demand is generally pretty straightforward for students. Um, to get full credit for your final draft, you will want to address each of these bullet points um, for the determinants of price elasticity of demand. Um, so it's best to just, I think, start off with the final product in mind, even though the grading for the milestone is um, not as high a bar as it will be for your final. But always good to try and do your best from the, from the very start. So the last element here in this section, in the last element of this milestone, is asking you to assess how the price elasticity of demand impacts the firm's pricing decisions. So this is where the, this element is really asking you to bring together the concept of price elasticity of demand and revenue. So there's a, a very clear relationship between those two things that we study in our course, and we're asking you to bring that idea in and see how it might impact the company's choices. So we've got the link here to that, uh, again, to a video from our textbook that reviews that relationship. Um, and we've given you an example here. So for instance, if a company sells a product that has very elastic demand, meaning that the consumers are very responsive to a price change, then increasing the price means that their total revenue will decrease. So if I sell something like um, a maid service, um, it's very easy to find a new maid service. Um, if I raise my prices as somebody selling maid service, my customers might decide, well, I can very easily go find a different maid service. So I would probably lose a lot of customers and lose a lot of revenue. So that's one example. So it depends on the direction of the price and it depends on um, whether demand is inelastic or elastic. So it's going to be different depending on the company you have and which kind of price change you're talking about. But this is where you can examine that relationship and apply it to your company. All right, so that was the last element. So I see a lot of questions. Um, let's take a look here. Looks like um, Dave asks if we're going to keep the milestones separate and not tying them together yet. Um, Dave, I would say that it's fine to do it either way. I have had students who want to work with just one Word document, and so they just add along as they go. So this would be the ending right here for them. Um, not before they, the cost of production is next. That's milestone three, so we're not there yet. So they would have everything up until this point. So you would open up your milestone one document and then start adding to it with these next two sections. Um, and some students like to keep them separate. It's really a personal preference. Um, I don't, you know, as an instructor myself, I wouldn't say to, for students to have to do it one way or the other. I can just scroll down and grade the stuff that's due for that milestone. If you do include the stuff from milestone one, um, just keep in mind that your instructor is probably not going to be reading that to, to give feedback on any edits you've made. Um, they probably won't, they're not going to do that until the final draft. So if you did make edits from your milestone one to now in these sections and you resubmit, um, don't, don't expect feedback on that just yet. I 
So, um, yeah, so it was Sam. Aaron asks, my company is Target and they sell a ton of products. Should I pick a specific product or type of product? Uh, and Kate answered, yes, please work on one type of product. I think that's, you won't be able to pick one specific product, Aaron, like, like, um, like Kate said, you'll probably have to pick a type of product, and you might want to, you know, maybe talk a, talk about one type of product and then maybe a couple others and, and treat them as whole, like housewares is one or clothing is another, because um, they might tell very different stories, and you might need to address more than one to give a clearer picture of what's going on. If So if revenue is increasing in Target, um, but sporting goods sales are down, it wouldn't make sense just to talk about sporting goods sales and talk about how sales are going down, but then we see that Target's revenue is going up. So you'll have to decide how you want to break it down when you do a retail company. Um, so that is one challenge with retail companies. The good news is that there's tons of information out there on a store like Target. Yeah, that's great advice that Ellen gave you to, to look at the types that, um, that make Target the most profit and focus on those as well. So um, Crystal asks about General Motors. So Crystal, um, General Motors obviously has many different types of cars and trucks and many different brands within General Motors. Um, but for the purpose of economics, um, a lot of the same ideas apply. So you don't have to do as much of a breakdown as someone doing a retail store like Target would have to do. But um, you'll definitely talk about you know which kinds of of cars are selling better or which kinds of trucks are selling better. Um, so in your instance, there might be a higher demand for luxury vehicles or there might be a higher demand for low mileage vehicles or energy efficient vehicles or maybe you know demand for a certain brand is increasing while demand for a different brand is decreasing. So those are the kinds of things you can look at. But for things like price elasticity of demand, um, that's pretty much going to be the same in general for all their cars. You won't have to look at that separately for each brand or each kind of car. So Brian asks about Netflix. Um, he asks if it would be beneficial to do mail or DVDs in relation to streaming services. So Brian, I think that that's a great question for Netflix and a lot of students pick that company. So hopefully others on here are listening and on the recording at home when they listen. Um, that's definitely a good thing to talk about in the trends and demand over time. Um, I don't know how much of their business remains the mail and DVD service. Um, I'm sure that you know better by now what portion of their revenue comes from that, that business stream. But in the price elasticity of demand section, you'll probably want to focus more on the um, streaming service subscription because I'm pretty sure that that's the bulk of their business these days. But for, definitely for the trends in demand, you want to explore that shift from DVD mailing to streaming. That's, that's a really, really great story right there, how they made that pivot. Because that goes along with consumer preferences. Right, and so Cindy made a good observation about Nike. You can look at clothing and sneakers. Yep, so that's, you know, sneaker, the sneaker market for Nike might be a little bit different than um, their workout apparel. So you can look at those separately if, um, if you find that they have different, different kinds of trends. Yep. All right, I'm just going to scroll back up and make sure I didn't miss any. We have a couple minutes left, so if you have questions, definitely get them in. I don't think we missed any, but if we missed your question, definitely feel free to retype it if it got buried above. But yeah, I mean, in, in general, you know, some, you know, the Netflix example, that's pretty much just one service that they have. I mean, the, you can still get the mailing, but in the end, it's, it's all very similar. And some of you are going to have companies that have lots of different things that they're selling. I mean, Apple's a good example um, where they've got a handful of different products, but their products have very different sort of demand profiles um, that you'll need to explore separately or if you decide to focus on one that's that's an option too if you've discussed that with your instructor um, definitely something to discuss with your instructor if that's the route you want to go um, so 
each each of you is going to have to sort of tackle this a little bit differently depending on the kinds of goods and services that your company sells. But this this outline, this guide here that's available to you in your um, in all of our courses in all of our sections is going to walk you through that and how to apply it to your company. And if you have to apply it to a few different business segments of your company, that's that's fine. I mean, we'll make your paper a little bit longer, but if it but if that's what your company does, then that's what you need to explore. Um, so Darcy asks um, about Dunkin' Donuts. Is it beneficial to use Starbucks as a comparison? Um, Darcy, that is accurate. You will want to do that, but we won't do that yet. Um, you can obviously look at the demand for coffee shops in general right now. In the overall market section, which comes in the next milestone, you are going to look specifically at competitors. Um, we don't have to look at competitors just yet, at least not in a, a really holistic way. Um, so I definitely, in this section, would not be sharing any data related to Starbucks revenue or sales numbers or number of locations or anything like that. Um, what I would recommend for somebody doing a retail shop like that, so this would apply to Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks or even like Target or Walmart. Um, we talked about showing revenue and sales figures. You could also show locate number of locations. So if, um, if you're doing Starbucks and they're, they've increased the number of locations from you know, 10,000 to 15,000, I'm just throwing out numbers, that's another way to show um, their, their expansion and, their, um, and, and how their, their supply, their increase in supply. So that would definitely come into this second element in supply and demand. Okay, someone, um, Altamese asks if um, we can get the example paper. Um, I don't, did anyone else have trouble getting the example paper? Are you referring, Altamese, to the one on Hershey, the student example? Okay, um, so if you are having trouble, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it should be in the resources folder. If it's, um, I'll check as soon as we're done the call to see if it's in each of the sections. And if it's not, I'll make sure that, um, that we provide that to everybody. Great. So hopefully you'll be able to find it there, Altamese, if it's there ready. All right. We have just a minute left. so. Last call for any questions. Otherwise, I just want to thank you all so much for coming um, and for getting all your questions up here. Um, and if that's it, then we will start getting ready for our Eco 202 folks. Um, Jennifer, if your instructor isn't contacting you back, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, Nicole might. I can put my email in here. Um, and you can also reach out to the dean. Um, but this will be shared, should be shared in all of your courses. And again, you can find um, it on my, my YouTube page, which um, is under my name, Nicole Soto. Yeah. And definitely, yeah. Our dean is, um, her name is Keely Griffith. So uh, I can give her email address as well in case that does happen. So you can reach any of us if you um, aren't, aren't getting a, a timely response from your instructor. All right, well, it's 9 o'clock. So thank you all so much for coming to the 201 session. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get ready for our 202 folks. So anyone on the line who is here for Eco 202, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I will say that the good news is that this milestone is a lot shorter than your last one. So this should be fairly quick. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions, and um, maybe you can finish up early, and you guys can get back on with your uh, Thanksgiving preparation. If you're like me and already... Shopping yourself silly at the grocery store. So, all right, let me pull up our guide. So, just like last time, for those of you who were able to join us last time, um, 
we are going to spend most of our time going through the guide um, that walks you through the actual PowerPoint um, itself and sort of serves as like a template to how you should address each of the critical elements. So this is the basic template. Looks has the same very plain SNHU background from the first one. You, you are free to jazz it up or you are free to stick with this one. <laughs> you are not really going to be judged on um, colorfulness. Although we do want the slides to look neat and uh, polished. So it's always nice to just go with this, but feel free to do something a little bit more interesting if that's your thing. I know a lot of students, this is their first time working with PowerPoint. So with that in mind, we wanted to give you a template that was easy to work with that you didn't have to fuss around a lot with. And that's the idea here. So um, if you're new to PowerPoint, it's probably just best to stick with the basics. And if you're very familiar with PowerPoint, you can add in some, some fancy stuff. Um, I will say that animations won't work in Blackboard. So if you put in an animation, your instructor's not going to be able to see it. So avoid that. But in terms of different backgrounds and, and styles of the slide, that is welcome, but not required. And shouldn't affect your grade in general, as long as everything looks nice. So this milestone is on fiscal policy. Now you can add this milestone to your first milestone, um, or you can keep it separate like we have here. Uh, it's completely up to you. Your instructor is just going to grade you on the three critical elements that we're looking at in this milestone. Um, so keep in mind that if, you make, if you've already made some edits to your first milestone based on your instructor's feedback, they're not going to be looking at those um, at that work to see if you've made any changes at this point. They'll do that on the final. So if you do some resubmit that stuff because you've got everything together, just keep in mind that they, they won't be looking out for any, any edits that you made. So fiscal policy. Um, fiscal policy is government spending that's designed to have a specific economic impact. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. So I want to make sure, first and foremost, that everybody understands um, that fiscal policy is different than just government spending in general. So the government might spend money on something like a war, but a war is not a fiscal policy um, in and of itself. A, you go to war for a geopolitical kind of reason or a safety reason, you don't necessarily, hopefully you don't go to war just to have some impact on the economy. So fiscal policy are policies that the, that the government puts in place to have a specific economic impact. Um, so tax policies and spending policies aimed specifically at having some change in the economy or responding to some economic problem. So those are the things that you're going to want to focus your, your research and analysis on. So we don't want to see too much talk about other kinds of government spending that aren't really fiscal policy. So that should help narrow it down a little bit in terms of what you want to look at. So once you've got sort of a clear understanding of this is what fiscal policy is, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to look for, then you can sort of get started and start gathering your information. The first slide, um, the first element, each slide is probably going to correspond to one, um, each element will probably correspond to just one slide. Um, maybe for the next one you might want a couple of slides, but in general um, they have a one-to-one -one ratio for, for this for most students. So the first slide goes along with that first element. And this is asking you to look at the policies in place, fiscal policies in place, at the start of your chosen decade. So you might need to go a little bit before the start of your time period to see what, what specific laws and bills were passed um, that were in place at the start of your decade. So let's say you pick 1990 to 1999. You know, there might have been a decision made in 1988 or 1989 that was in place in the early 90s. So you might have to backtrack a little bit to find when those policies were put in place. But in general, you want to get a picture of what did fiscal policy look like at the beginning of my time period? What, what did taxes look like? What did spending on programs like um, unemployment and uh, welfare look like at the time 
at the start of my time period. So that's, that's where, how you're going to start off this section, kind of giving some groundwork for what fiscal policy looked like. And that is going to open up the door for the next section, which is how that changes throughout your 10-year time period. So here in this guide, um, again, it goes over all the stuff that I've been talking about and also provides some general links to places where you might want to get started to do some research. Um, a good tip of advice is to search by president instead of to search by the year. So if you search by, you know, 1992 fiscal policy, you might not have a lot of success. But if you look, you know, George H.W. Bush fiscal policy, Clinton fiscal policy, um, you'll get a lot more, a lot more hits that way. Um, so these are some helpful websites. And then, you know, your typical browser search is, uh, you know, Google search is going to help find a lot of things too, um, if you look by president. All right, so the next section, um, this is where we get into a little bit more of the analysis. So that first one is kind of just laying out what the policy actions were, why they were in place. Um, this is where you're going to start to use some of the models that that we're developing this week. So the ADS model and the Keynesian consumption function are two examples. But you're going to look at how policies change over time. So you might have had a certain tax policy and a certain spending, spending policy at the start of your time period. And then, of course, those policies change as the economy changes because these policy actions are supposed to respond to changes in the economy. That's, so they always change. That's, that's the, the point, is to help sort of smooth out those business cycles um, and help you know, the economy keep going without too high highs and without too low lows. So there's always going to be some change, and you're going to examine those changes. Um, so you, just like above, you're going to sort of describe what the new policies are as they change. But in addition, you're also going to sort of analyze them with our models. So again, examples are the ADAS model and the Keynesian consumption function. So we're get, we've got links here to them to help you guys review. And then also explain why the action would lead to the outcome desired by the government. So if the government increases taxes to have a specific economic impact, you would use the model to explain why that policy would get them to that outcome. So if you're raising taxes to slow down inflation, you can use one of these models to explain why that would work. Why, how does the model say that that's what's going to happen? So you can talk about the model, or you can even try to draw the model. Um, I do have some examples of students who have you know, a very, very simple, just like in our textbook, where it's sort of just a downward sloping line for aggregate demand, upward sloping line for aggregate supply, and to show a shift, um, usually on the AD side, to show a shift in aggregate demand to show the policy change and um, how that would impact the overall economy. So it's something that you can do in PowerPoint very simply if you're you know, if you're comfortable doing those sorts of things. You can also borrow a graph um, from our textbook or from a website, as long as you cite it, that shows the shift that you would draw if you felt comfortable drawing it in, uh, in PowerPoint. So that's another option. Or you could discuss it without actually drawing the model. Um, it's, it's up to you. I think that the graph is helpful um, to show uh, because it really, it really shows your understanding. But um, you could also just describe describe the impact. And again, scholarly research is going to be required here. Um, same websites we showed on the last slide are going to be here. You're just going further into your decade. So the same searches, it just might be a different president, or it might be um, you know their later policy implementations. So again, the, the big thing here is that we want, we as the instructors want to know that you understand what these models mean and how they show the impact of a fiscal policy decision, like increasing spending or cutting taxes or a combination of any of those things. So it's important to understand the model and also what goes into aggregate demand, which is where government spending comes into play. 
So those are some things to keep in mind when you do your explanation. Um, a lot of your explanation is going to be in your notes section, just like we talked about last time. Um, you want the basics. Obviously, if you do a graph, the graph will be on the slide. Um, and then any bullet point, main points you want to make on the slide as well. Um, if you have a couple of policies to talk about because you had a very fiscal policy active decade, um, you might need more than one slide. Uh, some, some time periods don't have as much fiscal policy actions as others, so it really depends on which time period you picked. But you'll keep those basics on the slide, any graphs that you want to share, um, and then the main bullet points, and then the deeper explanation in the notes below. And then the last one, we only have three critical elements, so it's a lot shorter than last time, um, the, the fiscal policy impact. So, Oops, I rolled right past it. So this is where you're going to actually bring in the data to see, did the fiscal policy have the intended effect? Um, so if the, if the goal of the policy was to, like in the example I mentioned, was to slow down inflation, did it work? Um, you can very clearly see that with the data. The good news here is you've got a lot of the data already for milestone one. So you've got inflation data for every single year of your, of your time period. You've got unemployment data for all the years of your time period. And you have uh, GDP data for every year in your time period. So you can see if a policy that was put in place halfway through your 10-year time period had the intended effect in the following five years. Um, now, if there was a policy put in place towards the end of your time period, you might want to explore beyond your 10-year section to see if it had its impact. Because sometimes it might take a, a couple of years for um, the policy to have a full effect. Um, so that's something you might need to consider depending on, on how you broke out your time period because you don't have to pick a decade. You could pick you know, 75 to 85 if, if that's what you did. Um, so those are some things to consider. But you definitely want to leverage that data and specifically name it here. Um, and then talk about why or why not. Why did it work? Why didn't it work? Um, and then use, again, use your knowledge of what happened, how it was implemented, and the models to explain why. Um, so now, obviously, when they made the decision, they've got top economists working for them. So there should be some economic reason why they thought it would work. Um, but there's going to also be an economic reason why it didn't work. So you kind of get to explore both. You get to explore the original thinking, why it should work, and then if it didn't work, why didn't it work? And if it did work, it's generally going to be for the reasons that they, they intended. So you can explore that here in this last section. So that is really all you have to do here. Um, you will probably come away with uh, at least a handful of specific policies that you're going to investigate, including the ones from the beginning. So there might be a couple at the very beginning, and then um, for the second element, a few more that you're going to have to look into specifically. And you're just going to focus your time just on those, on those handful of policies. Um, again, you don't have to look at all government spending, because not all government spending is fiscal policy. Yeah, and Ellen, you make a great point. Um, there's some short run or longer run effects. So uh, in, a, in a decade where there wasn't really any economic turmoil, um, you might see some policy choices that were definitely more long run oriented um, because they had the luxury of sort of thinking more long term because there was no pressing concern like, you know, runaway inflation or you know, super high unemployment or, you know, a huge recession like we had in, in 2008. So those are some of the things that are going to impact, you know, the choices they make and the impact they have. Um, so definitely something to look out for and will differ depending on which time period you happen to pick. So thanks, Ellen. That was a good point. Yes, this is recorded. <laughs> um, we'll be sharing it. So just like we did last time, um, we'll, we'll share it with all the instructors as a YouTube link. And then we will um, ask that they all share it in each of the sections. 
So usually um, I get that, I get it converted and uploaded to YouTube sometime tomorrow morning. And so you should have it definitely no later than tomorrow afternoon in your class. And if not, you know, I'll share it again. It's, if you scroll up, you have it, but I can also share my email address if, um, if you don't see it in your classroom by, by tomorrow afternoon or evening, you can always give me an email and I can, I can send you a copy as well. I'm happy to do that. So if anybody has any questions about applying the models to specific policy actions or anything, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, otherwise, uh, students typically do pretty well in this section. Um, if you, again, if you search by your president, even, you know, this is not a site that you can use as a reference, but it's a good starting point. You could even use something like Wikipedia. You can go to, you know, President Reagan and under his Wikipedia page, he's gonna have a whole section on, on economics and they're going to talk about his fiscal policy, and they can refer to academic resources that you can use. So you can jump to those resources and use those as your references um, to get your information. So again, Wikipedia is not a place that you can cite, but it's a good jumping off point to find the right information and then go to those sources that can give you what you need. Yeah, you know, 1950, um, the 50s is actually a time where fiscal policy was a big player. Um, so think about, I mean, actually, this goes to Ellen's point. Um, so one big thing in the 50s was uh, the highway project under Eisenhower. So that was a huge undertaking um, that Eisenhower uh, put into place and um, might not have had, well, it definitely, you can think about it, you know, what are the short run effects of building an national highway system. So obviously that's going to take a lot of people working, so it's going to have an employment effect. But also think about how different our economy is now because we have this very well established highway system um, that has allowed our economy to grow in ways that it might not have otherwise. So it has a short run impact and it also has a long run impact. So that's, that's one, one specific thing um, in the 50s that you'll definitely want to cover. So yes, Ellen, thank you for hitting those three things. Apply the models, always use speaker notes. Speaker notes are basically re required. If you don't include speaker notes on all of your content slides, um, per the rubric on the final draft, it's going to be docked down to um, a failing grade on that element. So you don't want to lose points if you've got the content and you just haven't followed that part of the rubric. So that's, that's very important. Think about it like this. If there were no speaker notes, it would be like presenting a slide without saying anything. So it is required. And then yes, APA formatting of your citations. There is not a specific APA format for the slide itself. So I don't want anyone to go wasting any time looking for that. Um, but your citations, in-text citations, and your reference page, which is just a reference slide. I can show you an example down here um, are going to be APA style. So just like any, if you were in Eco 201 with us last term, same deal, all of our other um, undergrad business courses use APA. So hopefully it's familiar to you by now. Yes, and um, Kiara, that's a good point. There, student, for the students, there is a way to save your PowerPoint um, as a PDF with the notes. Um, the weird thing about Blackboard is that when you upload your, um, your PowerPoint, we actually can't see the speaker notes um, unless we upload it to our computer, um, which is doable, but it's, it's actually a lot easier uh, for us to give you feedback, you know, inline feedback if we can see your slide and your notes. So you can save your PowerPoint as a PDF and um, select the option um, to include the notes section. And I have a video about that on my YouTube channel as well. Um, and I'm not sure if it's in our resource section, but what I can do is I can, I can send that out 
along with um, the recording of tonight's session. So students can do that and hopefully make it easier on their instructors <laughs> to get you some accurate feedback. Yeah, I mean, you, you can probably just Google my video as well. Um, save a PowerPoint as a PDF with notes. It's, it's my most popular video. <laughs> All our Eco 202 students watch it by now. So it's not in the resource folder. OK, so we can um, see if we can get that added. And in the meantime, I'll email that out with tonight's recording so that your instructors can share that YouTube link as well. Yeah, Erin, it's OK if you forget to save it as a PDF. Um, it just it can slow your instructor down in terms of turning around um, your, your feedback and your grading. Um, but you know that's, that's not necessarily the end of the world. But it also prevents them from giving inline comments um, in, your, in your notes section. So if they want to highlight a certain area um, that you talked about and give you some feedback on it, it'll just be in the, in the rubric area, in the, you know, the blackboard area where your feedback is, instead of right on the, the document itself. So that, that's really the only downside. So Amanda is asking if I can post a link to my YouTube page. I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit and admit that I don't actually know what my YouTube page is, but I'm going to find it. <laughs> it's, um, it's not, it's a YouTube page carried over from my, my personal YouTube page, so I, I tend to forget what it is, but I can share with you all now, because I'm not the only Nicole Soto with a YouTube page, it would seem. Um... And let's see if I can figure out how to share it with you guys. Hmm. Well, I will give you the link. It's a messy link, but hopefully this will do. And you guys can test it and tell me if it works. Um, I thought there might be something that was a little bit easier to remember, but... Yeah, there are a lot of Nicole Sotos, unfortunately. Probably if you do eco Nicole Soto, it might narrow it down. But, ah, it's under my old email address. That's why, Kiara. Nicole G, 1981. I'm giving away my age. <laughs> so hopefully, Kiara should definitely work, and hopefully the other one works, too. Um, but probably better off trying Kiara's. <laughs> yeah, so you can find um, the recording from last uh, our last webinar from two weeks ago is on my channel, and then a bunch of other um, a bunch of other videos are up there, including the one for converting the PowerPoint to a PDF. All right. Doesn't look like we have any other questions. So I hope that that link works. Um, if you're able to try it, uh, if it doesn't, if it didn't work, please let us know. Um, especially the one Kiara gave. That's probably the better one. Um, one more question. So if if I mentioned the Ameri the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in Milestone One, is that a fiscal policy? Yes, Erin, that is definitely 100% a fiscal policy. That is a prime example of a fiscal policy. That, um, that, that bill, that law was put into place for the express purpose of responding to uh, the recession. And it had in it a bunch of um, tax changes and spending changes. So you can talk about some of the specifics within that bill. Um, and what they did. So what kinds of spending changes did they do? What kinds of tax tax changes did they do? That, that sort of thing. Yes, and you can subscribe to my page. <laughs> I don't post a lot, so <laughs> mostly just these webinars. Um, so just a few times a term. Yeah, um, definitely don't worry about repeating information. 
you, you're going to have to revisit information because you're going to be looking at it from a different angle. So in the first milestone, you probably mentioned that act just as a, something general that happened. Um, maybe it was one of your events. You didn't necessarily have to mention that, but um, you know, it certainly was something that would have impact on GDP and unemployment and um, probably not as much inflation at that time, but certainly on GDP and unemployment. But here, you're going to be looking at it from the lens of a specific model. So it's, it will make sense once you get going to revisit it again, because you're going to go into a little bit more detail, and you're going to be analyzing it from a slightly different perspective, not just from the numbers, but from the theoretical perspective. Yep, that's exactly right, Amanda. Thanks, Ellen. So um, Omnibus, you, you, you'll often see that term come up. Um, that's when they sort of vote on the, the budget, um, which will include tax and spending policies um, and any changes that they're making to those policies. So th that's a, a good term to look out for when you're doing your research is that Omnibus. Yes, Erin, it will definitely be um, make sense later. And, and then the next milestone is going to be monetary policy. So one thing I'll ask, and every once in a while I see a student do this, they'll start talking about monetary policy in this section. That is something you don't want to repeat. Um, again, this is fiscal policy, which is generally changes to taxing and spending by the federal government. Monetary policy is done by the Federal Reserve. So they're very distinct things, so it's very easy to keep them separate. So there's no need in this milestone to talk about anything that the Federal Reserve does. Just like in the next milestone, there won't be any need to talk about taxation and government spending. You really want to keep those in their own buckets for these two milestones. But in either of them, you're going to be borrowing stuff from your first milestone. All right. Well, we are almost at 930. Um, if there's no more questions, then thank you all so much. Um, we are having our webinar next week, but it will be early because of Thanksgiving. So um, I hope you can join us for that. Uh, if you can't because you're traveling, um, it will be recorded just like these ones have been. So keep an eye out for that. All right, thank you all so much for coming.